And let's see here. We are one minute away from showtime. I always get nervous on these events. It's so crazy. But um, I'm getting better. You would think two years, two and a half years in, I would be really good at this. I'm sure you're great at it. I always get nervous too. I, I do this often. I do. I always get nervous. Yeah. I well, I think that's good. You know, it's part of, it's part of making us be aware of things. Okay. <clears throat> All right, folks, it is now six o'clock and I wanna honor and respect your time um, as well as our speaker's time. So we are gonna get started. Uh, we are honored to have Catherine Pace Miles with us tonight. Uh, she's an associate professor in early childhood education at Brooklyn College, City University of New York. Dr. Miles' research interests include orthographic facilitation and mapping, high frequency word learning, literacy assessment of students with special needs, and literacy instruction for young children that is both developmentally appropriate and grounded in the science of reading. She works closely with New York's Department of Education to support literacy initiatives that impact the city's most underserved students. Dr. Miles proudly serves as the academic advisor for Reading Rescue, a professional development program, and an evidence-based literacy intervention provided to first grade students across New York City. She is also the creator of Reading Ready, an explicit and systematic word reading curriculum for kindergarten and first grade students. In addition, Dr. Miles supports the alignment of, our, of other early literacy programs with the field of reading science in an effort to close the research to practice divide. And I just wanted to tell you, Dr. Miles probably doesn't sleep very much because she's very, very busy. So we are so honored to have you. I want to give everyone a little background as to how uh, Dr. Miles was chosen. Um, I was listening to a podcast, um, I believe it's on Amplify, or it might be Glean, I can't remember now, but I refer to it often, and it talks about uh, high frequency words, and that, um, that it, it's, it's a little more complicated than we think, and that there's ways to teach it that we haven't been using. So Without further ado, Dr. Miles. Thank you so much, Donna. What a nice welcome. I was assuming you were going to say I haven't been sleeping because I have two young children. So that, that, those, that those are the, the, the top two culprits are those ones. And then my work uh, comes in third. So thanks so much for having me. It's an honor to be included. As Donna said, I'm a professor of early literacy. So I researched the development of literacy from pre-K to second grade as well as instructional approaches um, that align to the science of reading. I'm a former teacher. So I taught uh, kindergarten, second grade, and third grade and was a reading specialist before I went into academia. It was my journey from education, from the field of education into the field of educational psychology um, where I started, my mind started exploding. I had the honor to work with Dr. Linnea Airy for my PhD, who's um, one of the most well-known uh, theorists in the field and one of the greatest reading scientists that the, the field has had. So I'm gonna connect um, my training from Dr. Airy to what I'm doing now in practice. Uh, so I do a lot of research and then I interpret it and bring it into practice. That's, I keep myself, I think, relevant by doing work through these intervention programs, Reading Rescue and Reading Ready. So again, thanks for having me. Today, we're gonna to focus on high frequency words what, why, how, as it pertains to the science of reading. So we'll talk a little bit, we can't talk about high frequency words in my mind, unless, in my opinion, I guess, in, unless you talk about orthographic mapping. I've conducted some research that um, analyzes high frequency words and how we go about teaching high frequency words through the lens of orthographic mapping. So I'll tell you about that. And then we'll talk about the implications that this research has on practice, my understanding is that you, many of you are wonderful, incredible practitioners that are trying to figure out uh, wh what the research says about what we should be doing with high frequency words. So let's start here. I put these terms at the beginning of a lot of my talks because 
I want to acknowledge the confusion that exists between research and practice. We've got all these terms out in the field, sight words, high frequency words, irregular words, decodable words, content function vocabulary words. Some of you may be easily, readily able to jot down precise definitions. Others of you, like me at one point, I could not distinguish, or it would have taken a lot of muscle or a bit of Googling to distinguish between some of these terms and what was going on in my classroom. By the end of this talk, I hope that we all have clarity on this list of terms. So let's start, we're gonna talk about high frequency words, but let's start with how we read words in general. And this comes out of the field of reading science. Uh, Ari explains that there are four ways that words are read. So in all of her writings, she will go back, she will refer to these and say, through the research, it has been demonstrated that you can read words by prediction. You can use context clues and partial alphabetic knowledge. This strategy though is not reliable. That's what has been demonstrated over and over again. A more reliable way to read words is through analogizing or by analogy. This is when you think of word families. If you know part of the word, you can switch out that initial sound. If you know jump, you can read dump. You, you, if you know mountain, you could read fountain. So that's analogizing. The third way is by decoding. So in here I'm breaking words down into IPA. So you can, you should be analyzing words into their letter sound or grapheme phoneme correspondences. You can also use syllables. You can use prefixes, root, roots, and suffixes as your knowledge, um, as your decoding skills become more sophisticated. So we're at three ways that you can read words. And the fourth is by memory from sight. So you see a word, you're able to say the word from memory. An important way to organize these approaches is to consider if the word is known or unknown. So we have these four approaches. And now let's say, okay, if it's an unknown word, what are the ways that we should go about um, trying to read that word? This time I'm gonna start, last, on the last slide, I started from the least reliable to the most reliable. And now I'm flipping the order. I'm, I'm in this category, I'm saying this is the most reliable. If it's an unfamiliar word, the priority should be for decoding the word. After that, you could use analogizing, and at times you may use prediction. If the word is familiar, we can't even help ourselves. This is what cognitive psychology has shown. We can't even help ourselves. We will read the word automatically by sight. This, it will be immediately retrieved. So all words, when they've been practiced, become read from memory by sight. And you may be thinking, okay, well then I've got these three ways to get it into memory. Well, what Aries theory of orthographic mapping tells us is that it is through the process of analyzing spelling sound relationships in the word that forms a glue that gets that word into memory. So this is Aries theory. This is the slide that uh, Linnea Aries uses. She lets me borrow it. Um, to depict the amalgam that is created by the process of orthographic mapping. This theory of orthographic mapping is the most substantiated theory of how words are stored in memory. It's based on decades of research. Orthographic mapping refers to the process of connecting letters in the spellings of words to sounds in their pronunciations. It is applied when words are read and when they are spelled. So it's this connection forming process that secures spellings of the words in memory, and it enables students to read words by sight and to spell words. So it's knowledge of the grapheme phoneme system that provides this clue. And this mean, I don't mean to be neglecting meaning over on the side, the, the spelling pronunciation is in red, like this really matters. The meaning part of the word, how it is, um, the semantic use, the syntactical use, that also helps to, to secure and create a strong amalgam or a strong memory of that word, a retention of that word. So again, all words, the goal is that all words have this, these sets of connections and that this like index card, this amalgam is put into long-term memory so that you can retrieve the word when you see it. 
I, I throw this up here. What research says is the best way to store words in memory is to analyze letter sound or grapheme phoneme correspondences in words. Over and over, the research shows this. Some students need a few exposures to this, this letter sound connections in the, in the word. Other students, and I know many of you have worked with them, as have I, they need 50 opportunities with the same word. It feels sometimes like they need 100. But that is what will get that word into memory. So it's great that we have the capacity to do this sophisticated thing called orthographic mapping, but what underlies that? What skills do students need in order to execute right on their orthographic mapping for, or for these orthographic mapping skills to kick in? So again, Ari breaks this down in her writings. She says, the skills you need, and as practitioners, this is what you should be looking for in the development of your students. Do, do your students have phoneme segmentation skills? Are they able to analyze uh, the pronunciation of a word into its smallest parts? Do your students have grapheme phoneme knowledge? Do they have letter sounds and then letters wind up combining together in digraphs and vowel teams, et cetera? Do they have knowledge of those phonic skills? Then when they get to a particular word, are they able to connect the letters in that word to their sounds? And is there storage of that particular word? I often use the example of rain. Is the student able when they come upon rain and they analyze it a few times, are they able to store rain as R-A-I-N instead of R-A-N-E? Both are permissible in the English language. You, it's through analysis of that word over and over that you realize, okay, yeah, I have to get rid of that R-A-N-E one. I've got to start using R-A-I-N. And then finally, as I mentioned before, word meaning. So this spelling sound connections have to be bonded to the meaning of the word. Again, it could be semantic or syntactical. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more when we talk about function words. So why should we care about orthographic mapping? I've got my little kiddo here with his head down. It's like, well, is this just some, you know, okay, it's substantiated by the research. Well, as practitioners, we know the essence of reading difficulties lies in inefficient word reading. When a student is inefficient with their word reading skills, they have to rely on phonic decoding and context guessing. Phonic decoding is great. I'm going to talk about it in a second, why phonic, why phonic decoding is so important. But if you have to rely on phonic decoding at all times over many years, that requires a lot of mental energy. When you're only using those phonic decoding skills, you know, your comprehension is compromised. You have to use, use up all your mental energy just to figure out what the words are. I'm gonna go back in a, in, a, in, a, in a few slides, I'm gonna double down though on why phonic decoding is so important. It's the pathway to orthographic mapping. And here's where I'm gonna get into this right now. So these are uh, Kilpatrick's explanation of word reading. I find to be very helpful for talking about why you need, why you don't wanna spend all your time in phonic decoding, but why you need it in order to get to orthographic mapping. So Kilpatrick explains that in his review of the research, there are three levels of word reading that come up over and over again. So students start at level one with their knowledge of letters and sounds. They move to level two, which is phonic decoding. This is where students have that letter sound knowledge and they have some basic phonemic awareness blending skills. And they start putting the parts of the words together in order to read words. This is also where David Sher's self-teaching hypothesis comes into play if you're aware of David Sher's uh, research. It's David Sher say sometimes you, you have four exposures to the word before it's stored and it, it goes to students we know who need many, many more exposures um, in order for, for the word to be stored in memory. Then students move into level three, which is there when orthographic mapping comes online. In this stage, students have mastered their letter sound knowledge in the words that they're, that they're reading. They have advanced phonemic awareness skills. And because they have these skills, they can now go whole to part. So they're able to see the word and instantaneously say the word because it has been mapped in memory. 
So I just, I don't want anyone to confuse this with whole word reading though. And that's why I have created this diagram. So this is my depiction of the three levels of uh, word reading as they pertain to orthographic mapping. So this is where I'm combining Ari Kilpatrick and David Cher's work. So students start with a pile of letters. They've got this basic letter sound knowledge that they can't use them to read words yet. So the plane sits on the tarmac, okay? So a very important stage, but we're not getting much lift off with word reading. Then they transition into applying letter sound knowledge along with their phonological blending skills to read the words. This is represented by the child sounding out b, i, g, and eventually reading big, okay? And we, we know this, this is like the nail biter stage. Every time you're like, are they gonna get the word? Are they gonna get the word? Um, this is an arduous process. It's represented by this effortful part of takeoff when liftoff feels precarious. At least that's how it always feels to me. I'm a, an anxious flyer. So you're like, oh, okay, we're getting there. Sometimes it's feeling a little better than other times. Depending on the child's skills, it, it could take, again, multiple exposures or few exposures to get to this point where they see the word and they say it. And I have the whole word in the sound boxes this time. They have, they can say big when they see the word. The reason they can do that is because they moved through that phonic decoding stage. And now what's stored in memory are those red anchors. So those red sounds, that's what's been glued and solidified in memory. So this is the stage of word reading when you feel the release and takeoff, when the plane doesn't feel so heavy and the climb feels less effortful. I also have this severe angle here to represent the exponential growth in word reading skills as soon as orthographic mapping comes online. And you know, many of you might be you know, in the second grade, first, second, third grade area. This is just so amazing if you're able to um, be in that stage of teaching, that level of teaching when you were working with students where the things just start clicking and they take off. So again, I just wanna remind everyone that there, if ever I'm saying you read the word, you read the whole word, please don't confuse this with whole word reading. When we read words, as Stan Listahane has told us, we parallel process all the letters in the word. So we're always looking at the letters in the word. We can look at those in 1 20th of a second. We're lifting those words and analyzing the words. And that's how we know it's the word big and not beg. Just wanted to clarify that. So if we know readers progress through this manner in their word reading skills, why do we go like this in schools? So often when students are in this delicious phonic decoding stage, we suddenly start doing lots of flashcarding. So, and I also, I'm so interested in, I have somewhat dedicated my career now to this because this is also what I did when I was teaching. And so I was analyzing my own practices when I started doing research here. Um, I think my theory around why, why we do this is because it, there's this lack of intuition with orthographic mapping. It seems like we read words as whole units, so educators like myself thought that this instructional approach would expedite the process. We're, we're thinking that if we do this, it'll get word stored faster. Um, my great concern now, after what I've seen in my research and in others' research, is that we're doing this and we're using it more with students who have fallen behind in their literacy skills, when really what we're gonna talk about is that this should be used less and less, especially for partial alphabetic readers. It's the exact, uh, flashcarding is the opposite of what those students need. So we should pause here to acknowledge this important distinction between terms um, around the term sight words. So there's two opposing definitions to the term sight word. So in the research realm, and again, I'm gonna to refer to Ari, she explains that sight word reading is a process by which the brain acquires information about a word's identity and analyzes the visual phon phonological links made between the spelling of the word and its pronunciation, and that repeated encounters with the word help cement it in the reader's mind. So that when you come upon the word, you're able to access it quickly and say the word automatically. In practice though, I know when I was teaching in schools and I know in New York, I'm not quite sure what's going on in Wisconsin, but in New York, the term sight word reading refers to often flashcard 
uh, reading or pop word reading or list word reading of high frequency words because the belief is that these words are too irregular to decode. So you just need to memorize them or learn them in a snap. To totally understand like the, how we got here as a field of education is very understandable actually. It makes a lot of sense when you look at and you start reading more about orthographic mapping. It makes sense that we all made this leap um, to flashcarding and whatnot. My hope is that by the end of this talk, we'll walk away with an understanding of what we could do differently. So in some of my writings and publications, I use this you know, bold statement like, sight word reading is not flashcard reading. Okay. So I, I'm gonna pause here to have another moment of the best way to start thinking about high frequency words. Now that you have had a moment with the theory of orthographic mapping, and you've considered the levels that words um, that readers go through in order to read words, it's important to pause and to think about the category of words that called high frequency words. These are simply words that are used a lot. That's all they are. They're, they are not necessarily a protected class of words. The theory of orthographic mapping does not discriminate between words. It's applied to all words. High frequency words are, many of them, as you'll see in my research, many high frequency words. In fact, the majority, overwhelming majority, are regularly spelled words. That means that they're decodable. Okay, the majority are decodable. So if you apply the theory of orthographic mapping, you would analyze letter sound relationships, you would segment and blend these high frequency words. If you do that a few times, that word will probably be securely stored in memory. Maybe some other students need it a lot, but still it's better than just flashcarding and not knowing when it's gonna click in. Many, there are some high frequency words, but it's the minority as you'll see in, our, in my research are irregularly spelled. That is true. There are some that are irregularly spelled, which means you can't really decode them. When, that, when you come upon those words, research says you still should use the reliable letter sound relationships in those words as an anchor. The word island is a great example. That's like a word that we kind of like, oh, it's crazy. It just has one silent letter and you should acknowledge that silent letter and use everything else as anchors for, in, um, in memory, and you should segment and blend the word using those anchors. So it's a, that's like a different like mind. We're, gonna, we're having this mind shift, mindset shift around high frequency words in this moment as we transition to into these studies. So while I was studying with Ari, I became really interested in this misinterpretation of the, her theory of orthographic mapping and the widely um, used practice of taking high frequency words and putting them on flashcards. Again, it was also personal because that's what I did when I was a teacher. So I'll walk you through some of uh, the findings and some of the research that I've conducted in this realm. And I'm gonna go through this part pretty quickly so we, we, we have time for questions at the end. So I examined the difference between high frequency words and how they were presented to young children. So we divided a subset of high frequency words into content words versus function words. So. I didn't, I didn't even start with the orthographic regularity. I just said, well, these are interesting words. Some of them have definitions that are held within them. Okay, the, the word crab or house or farm, those are content words. You can define the word easily. Function words are words that you can't really define. You have to use the word in a sentence in order for the syntactical use or meaning of the word to come through. So words like for, was, with, et cetera, those are function words. I worked with kindergartners. Half of the kindergartners um, in, in my sample were non-native English speakers, half were native English speakers. The content words should have been more difficult to learn because they were at a much higher reading level. They were at second and third grade level. And the, func so the function words should have been easier for those students to learn to read. And in research, we have, to, we have to have a lot of variability. So we have to have challenging words that we use. We presented the words either in isolation on a flashcard or in context. So we embedded it in a sentence. What was interesting about the, the study is even though grade level favored function words, they should have been easier to learn. Function words were actually more difficult for these students to read 
and spell and use for both Nate use in a sentence for both native and non native English speakers, both initially and over time. So here you see the content words on top, even though these were at a higher reading level, these were easier to learn at the start and over time and the function words were more difficult. Then obviously the pre presentation of how I presented the word, whether in isolation or in context mattered with regards to what students paid attention to. They got more out of learning how to use the word, obviously, if the word was used in a sentence. So that part wasn't, wasn't that radical. Um, what happened after this, though, was interesting. So some people interpreted this because the presentation actually favored orthographic learning of the words. So students were able to better spell words if they were presented in isolation. But what I did is I said, well, hold on, I'm not advocating for flashcard reading here, especially because there's so many function words. What we did after that was we analyzed um, the difference between kindergartners who are at a partial alphabetic phase, so your real pre-readers, versus students who are at a full alphabetic phase. Those students were into their decoding realm of reading. So we looked at the underlying foundational skills that account for students' ability to actually benefit from flashcard word reading. I said, all right, let me dig into flashcard reading a little bit more. So now I looked at content versus function words only if it was presented in isolation, which is often how we use flashcard reading in schools. So again, this, was, this analysis was done with kindergarten, 81 kindergartners, half were native English speakers, half were non-native English speakers. And what we found here were that, was that students with higher level language and vocabulary skills had an easier time learning function words, but the stronger language skills were only helpful for full alphabetic readers. And that's because it's likely that those students had the anchoring ability that comes with the phase of being in a full alphabetic reader. They had the skills necessary to segment, blend, and map these words. Partial alphabetic readers were not successful in reading the words on flashcards. They did not have enough phonemic awareness skills when we looked at those pretests, and they didn't have enough letter sound knowledge. So in this report, I talk about how reading function words on flashcards very likely was a futile task for these uh, partial, these partial alphabetic, these pre-alphabetic, partial alphabetic readers. Um, they just didn't have enough skills to be successful. It was not a good use of their time. So it's really something for us to think about um, as educators of young children. Time is likely better spent strengthening their phonemic awareness skills and their letter sound knowledge and doing blending and word analysis work. From there, I became even more interested in the use of high frequency words. So I started with analyzing these high frequency words that were content versus function words. Then I became interested in the orthographic regularity of words on these lists. And I said, wow, these words are really interesting. Many of them are regularly spelled. They follow typical letter sound relationships. Some of them are temporarily irregularly spelled, which means they, they're decodable. They have letter sound relationships that you can decode, but they're not, kindergartners aren't ready to decode them yet. And then when you move up to first grade, there's a, there's a group of these words that first aren't ready to decode yet, but still they're decodable. And then of course, like I mentioned before, there are some that are permanently irregularly spelled. This means that they have letter sound relationships that are idiosyncratic to that word or only a few others. They have, the, those letter sound patterns are violators, like the A and was is not doing what it's supposed to the silent letter in island, you know, that's throwing students off, it throws adults off, et cetera. So we use these three categories. So these categories come from the researchers that I've listed here, but we applied rules to these categories. This is where we extended the research. And what we did is in, in this initial report, we just looked at this small subset. You, I'm you're sure you recognize all of these. These are from the Fry, I believe these are the first 50 from the Fry, uh, high frequency word list, any high frequency word list you're using likely comes out of the Fry or the Dolch. Um, what interests me about these, the, these sets of words is that they're called sight words, but now you know, because you know the reading science 
definition of sight words. These are not sight words, right? Students have not securely stored them in memory. They're definitely not reading them by sight. Otherwise, we wouldn't be flashcarding them. I was so intrigued by these lists because they're full of function words. And I had just conducted a study that showed that function words were more difficult for students to read, spell, and use. Okay, and I'm looking at these lists, I'm like, wow, there, there's a lot of function words here. I also became fascinated with the fact that when I analyzed the orthographic regularity, that's just a fancy way of saying decodable, like are they decodable? When I looked at this list, 80% of the words on the dolch and 72% of the words on the, the first set of fry words are decodable. You can actually decode them. And I thought, gosh, why, why was I putting these on flashcards? Like, what was I doing? Um, and then I thought about my research with these partial alphabetic readers in kindergarten, and it just broke my heart because I saw so clearly that these, the time was not, it was not well spent for these students. So often these words are used with those most emergent readers. I thought, eek, um, I've got to do something about this. So I started going around town in New York and asking teachers to analyze uh, this is the first 50 words on the fry list. I'm sure many of you have, have this list around somewhere. I started asking teachers to, with me to analyze the words into these categories. So highlight all the words that are regularly spelled for a kindergartner. Like what words could a kindergartner read if they, all they know are their consonant and vowel sounds? And I said, put in blue the words that would be temporarily irregularly spelled. That means like if you got to that digraph, maybe they could decode it, right? But if they didn't get to that digraph, it'll come up at another time. Now, some of these you might look at and you might say, well, that's pretty sophisticated. The fact that in the word from, O says a, uh, but actually in the English language, that's a, a graphing pattern that occurs quite a lot. So in blue, we have temporarily, irregularly, and in red, we've got our permanently, irregularly spelled words. The, does it, the X's, do you guys know what the X's represent? You, these are all, anything with an X next to it, those are all function words. Look at this list. It is riddled with function words. So now what we know now is like, oh my gosh, we gotta, we gotta keep an eye on these function words. Also, we've really, you know, we're considering native language use, et cetera. So um, I won't tell you, uh, that article is available. I'm gonna drop my website at the end of this and the article is free, you can, you can read it there. At the end of the article, we talk about like, what would you do then? What are you gonna do with these high frequency words? And we give you, uh, we give teachers, we use this in our research in, in New York, we give you this protocol to use and this double decker, you guys have seen this before. This is, this is nothing revolutionary. It's the double decker all cone and boxes. You put chips, you slide the chips, you map the letters into the boxes. In the two intervention programs that I'm associated with, I use this for high frequency words, for not high frequency, I use this for everything. And I'll show you here, what we've done is, we've done research projects where the words are regularly spelled had h a d right and we're working with children kindergartners doing this we do this with temporarily irregularly spelled words so kindergartners or first graders who are ready for the word this we're mapping that th into one box so these are words that are decodable you just have to know that digraph right right you've got to know that vowel team if it comes up and then you can start mapping it and we also do this for permanently irregularly spelled words. And some people are like, oh my gosh, don't go there. I said, you wouldn't believe the success we've had doing this with irregularly spelled words and, and having kids circle it, underline it, highlight it, doing this a couple of times has really helped identify the anchors. Remember, you wanna know the anchors. S and D are your anchors for the word said. If all the student has to remember, instead of four letters for the word said, if they only have to remember that in the middle it goes AI, that's a lighter cognitive load. For young children, we always want to reduce cognitive load. So that's what we're, we're doing in our intervention work now. And by we, me, I mean my research assistants and colleagues. So I'll quickly move through this. So um, prior to COVID, I was doing a lot of work with Devin Kearns, uh, my colleague at UConn, where we were analyzing 
all of the words on the high frequency word list. So there's actually in the Dolce and the Fry combined, it's 419 high frequency words that I believe are used from kindergarten through third grade. And so this, this work I do comes, you know, on, you know, I'm standing on the shoulders of all these phenomenal researchers here who have done work like this. I just decided to apply it specifically to these high frequency words. I worked with teachers and I asked them to be my expert coders and Devin wrote a computer program to analyze these words. What I, we created all, I just wanted to show you this, we thought really deeply about kindergartners and the phonics skills that they're learning, that, those are your regularly spelled words, versus the phonics skills that they may not be they're learning, but those are they, they can fall in temporarily, and then things we fully acknowledge are permanently irregular. So we just thought through that. And what we found is on the 419 words that we analyzed, like a bunch of lunatic researchers, right? We said, are these regularly, temporarily, or permanently irregularly spelled? What we found is that 21, you'll see the charts here, 21% were regularly for kindergartners. If this was first graders, this bar would be much higher because they've learned more phonics skills. For second graders, it'd be even higher. 63% were temporarily irregularly spelled and 16% were permanently irregularly spelled. You can collapse over it here and think about it this way. 84% of the words are decodable on these high frequency word lists. 16% were per, are permanently irregular. That's what we found in our research. Devin did something really fancy and created all these computer things. And he was trying to, he's trying to check the humans, right? The expert coders, like, does that really align? Devin found almost the exact same results. He put all the words through this corpus and all this stuff, 86% were decodable, 14% were permanently irregular. And he was comparing, the experts were using their own phonics knowledge. He was comparing it against all of these rules of English. So it just shows us that these words, the list of these high frequency word lists are overwhelmingly filled with words that are decodable, which is great. From there, I started uh, getting into word walls. And I thought, okay, as an offshoot of my work of these 419 words, I wonder what's going on with word walls across New York. So I investigated whether the words on these classroom word walls have reliable graphing phoneme relations, because as I'm like linking through what I'm learning in the science of reading, I'm like, okay, if the word has reliable, letter sound relationships, like it can be decoded. If it can be decoded, why post it? That, that's the thought that we should all be having. Okay, why post it? It would be better to, and to do something with that word and then move on and then come back to it and do something. If it's posted, we're not, we may not be analyzing it. So if we know that the best way to store it in memory is through phonic decoding, we should do something with it instead of just posting it. So what we found is, and I apologize, my scales are off here, but what we found is that overwhelmingly the words posted on word walls were decodable. So they have reliable letter sound relationships. So instead of using, and I should say, I surveyed the teachers and the teachers said to me, oh, I post it so that the students can, can go up and just copy it. Or I post it because the students just need to memorize it. And so I went back to the teacher and said, actually, we can work with these words. We can do something more than just posting it. An interesting side note to that research is that I found a troubling amount of different sounds um, were posted underneath each letter. And this, was, this would cause a lot of confusion for emergent readers. So again, this is an IPA, but for example, on, on one word wall under the letter A, there were seven different sounds, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different sounds represented by the letter A. It was, there was a word that had A, a word that had A, a word that had R, a word that had A, et cetera. So if this is where, you know, Mary Dahlgren um, were working on a paper talking about word walls versus sound walls and how, supporting teachers and how, why we should be moving towards sound walls. So I was, I was put to task then. It was like, okay, so that's interesting about the research and whatnot. What should we do in classrooms, right? So my latest research project um, is one in which I developed this high-frequency word game. 
And I've had teachers, my researchers, my grad students in New York are all teachers in the field, uh, typically around Brooklyn. And so we've been using this high frequency word game. And uh, the, what we do in this game is we have a set of dice, we have a set of cards. So you have one of the dice represents uh, the three colors. There's a green, a yellow, and a red dot, two greens, two yellows, two reds on, on that one. The other one has, I'm gonna go forward for a second. Let me go, looks like this. And you cover it, we use these big, we're a ragtag operation. It's not like we've made anything look too pretty here. We cover it with the different modes of phoneme blending. And so you roll the first dice and the, and the student picks a yellow card. Well, the yellow card might have a temporarily irregularly spelled word, okay? The student doesn't read it, they slide it to the teacher. Then the student rolls the other one and they get, let's say, head, shoulders, knees, and toes, this middle one. So the, the teacher said, says the word is last. And the student has to go, well, ah, st. Okay, segment the sound. All the students in the group write the word on a wipey board or attempt to spell it on the wipey board and then everyone checks. Okay? Now just, you know, this is tap the sounds. The person is march the sounds. I showed you head, shoulders, knees, and toes. This little staircase, we just got blocks from a classroom and a little figurine, and the figurine has to jump the sounds, bingo stampers, and then classic um, sound boxes. We've had a lot of fun doing this. So uh, when, when, when all students are segmenting at the, at the end, all students are segmenting together and spelling the words so on their wipey boards, this is what it looks like. That's, that's our version of a wipey board and the spelling it underneath. In a recent action research project, we had some really nice results that showed growth from pre to mid to post, both on word reading and their spelling skills. And I have this infographic, I can't show you the whole game right now, but I have this great infographic it, that my, I can't take credit, my grad students created it, that I can uh, drop in the chat at the end. And it gives you all of the steps to play this. And again, we were playing this game with high frequency words. That's how we went about um, trying to secure these words in memory through uh, word analysis um, instead of memorization. So I want to remind everyone that the best way to store words in memory is to analyze the letter sound or graphing phoneme correspondences in the word. That's what we know from the theory of orthographic mapping, etc. So the implications for instruction, if we consider the theory of orthographic mapping, if we consider this research on high frequency words, my takeaways from this have been for instruction, the mindset should be what I mentioned before. High frequency words are simply words that are used a lot. They're not a protected category. They're not all permanently irregular. They're not crazy words. When you look at your list of high frequency words, you can, should consider these two things. What are, how could you apply, maybe let's say the three categories of orthographic regularity for your students. How many of those words do you, your students know how to decode? Put those in your regularly spelled category. Put together a bin of words for temporarily irregularly spelled and think to yourself, I'll get to some of these this year at some point, right? Then think about whether the word is a function or a content, content word and always consider if your students are native or non-native English speakers and think about how you would use, use that word um, to help secure the uh, retention of that word in memory. Then consider this idea of your students. Are they partial or are they full alphabetic readers? If they're partial alphabetic readers, definitely, in my opinion, from my research, I would shy away from any type of flashcarding whole word reading. If you have full alphabetic readers that you think, because some you, some of you may be thinking, oh, well, actually, some of my students are doing really well with flashcard reading. That could very well be the case. The likelihood is, is that they are full alphabetic readers or they're emerging, they're on the way, they're in, they're in that realm. You should consider if it's a really good use of their time and they, you think it's working to secure the mental orthographic image of the word, so be it. You should also consider, is it necessary? 
Is it necessary for that student? Do they need to be doing that if they're a full alphabetic reader? Could time be better spent doing something else? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe uh, this is just what they need. Partial alphabetic readers are different though. Um, they need, those students need more time decoding and less time memorizing. And finally, the approach would be any opportunity you get to analyze letter sound relationships and use anchors should be applied to high frequency words. I have a very simple study going on in New York right now where one of my grad students who's a uh, Brianna first grade teacher, all she's, she's a first grade teacher in uh, a school with very low English language arts proficiency scores in New York. And all she's doing, decided to do all year long is a religious approach to whenever a new word is introduced, she counts the number of sounds in the word. She'd say, oh, the word last, how many sounds are in the word last, last. She counts the sounds, she takes a beat and just maps the letters to those sounds and moves on. That's it. And whenever she can throughout the day, she's doing that when a new word is introduced. She doesn't, she's not adopting a new curriculum. She's not buying anything or anything like that. That's all she's doing. And we're gonna, we'll report back as to how, um, how her students are doing it. It's a new approach to her because she just really wants to double down on that. In summary, I told you we would clarify those terms. Let me just check where we are. I'm doing this fine on time. So this is my last slide here. I wanna circle back on the terms and make sure we're all on the same page now. So we all have a corpus of words that we know. So our lexicon of words. Words fall on a continuum from being lower frequency words to being higher frequency words. So words fall on this continuum. All words can be, whether it's a lower or a higher frequency word, can be categorized as regularly, temporarily, or permanently irregularly spelled based on an individual's phonic skills based on their letter sound knowledge skills. So a kindergartner's categorizations are different than a first grader's or different than a second grader's. Even within the kindergarten classroom, you have different groups of students who will have different buckets of words. We've also talked tonight about how words can either be content or function words. So you've got that layer of these words as well. And now you know the difference between the two. And of course, you know, I'm sure vocabulary words, you guys know how to, how to explain those. Sometimes I was meeting uh, up with new teachers in New York and they were confusing the term vocabulary word with the term high frequency word. So vocabulary words for individuals for whom English is their native language, vocabulary words would be lower frequency words, okay? Words that you don't hear that often that you need a definition of. For uh, new learners of English, multi-language learners, uh, vocabulary words could include high frequency words, right? Obviously, a non native English speaker may not know what the word house means because they're new to the language. Regardless, all words, the goal is that all words are eventually read from memory by sight, okay? It doesn't matter if it's a high frequency, low frequency, content word, permanently irregular word, all of those things. If we apply the theory of orthographic mapping and if we plot, apply the learnings from the field of educational psychology, we would recognize that we want all words to be read by sight. And the way we do that is moving students through that phonic decoding into orthographic mapping uh, stages, moving them through those stages. So uh, this is just some of the research and you can find me here. So um, you can find my faculty page at the Brooklyn College faculty page. You can see some of my research and talks and whatnot. I have a website I'm gonna drop where you can find all of those infographics. I also have a program that's free for anyone who needs it for kindergartners or first graders where I dramatically uh, de-emphasize uh, high frequency words and I emphasize Decoding. So it's a lift off into word reading curriculum where we do letter sounds, uh, phoneme segmentation, eight different forms. Think of like Hegarty, like eight different forms of phoneme segmentation and blending and whatnot. We do word analysis through word chains and word mapping, which is what you saw a lot tonight. And then I wrote, I think it's 120 decodable sentences 
So each lesson, you can get 60 intervention sessions out of this. Each intervention session would last about 15 to 20 minutes. The student has all of these words to read and they only need in the first you know, 30 sessions, they only need three high frequency, irregular, three irregular high frequency words. Even to read all 120 sentences, they would only ever need six. And we introduce those six words incrementally. So I'm really trying to de-emphasize the hysteria and need for these high frequency words. Mm -hmm. So I will stop sharing and drop those and take questions. Oh my goodness, Dr. Miles. That's amazing. I just love, love, love all of this information. So uh, we have a question in the chat. Um, what else would the full alphabetic do to be better use of time versus flashcards? Mm. Word analysis work. So if I was in full, for full alphabetic readers, I would have them doing as much word analysis work as possible. So you could be doing word chains, word mapping, like you saw. You could be doing word ladders. I don't know if you, it, when you're, it's like word chaining only, you're moving up the ladders. You can be doing, um, si I had this whole, I have a worksheet actually that I could send you guys. Um, you could be doing similar word reading where you're changing only one letter in the word. And so step to step to stop to da da da, like those kind of highly, highly, highly confusable. And the students are attempting to not rush read, not speed read, but they're moving through those. Um, and I have, a, I, have six, I have six ways to do this word analysis. So I can pull those up as well in that worksheet. Wonderful. So if what you could do is send me all of these links. Oh, and sure. Then, and then I'll send them out to everyone who registered. So everyone will have that. Okay. Great. Another question. Um, oh, we got a two-parter here. Two questions. If orthographic rep, sorry, I can't read. If orthographic mapping includes spelling, then why does spelling come so much later, even for kids who are typically developing readers? If orthographic mapping includes spelling, why does spelling like lag behind word reading? Mm -hmm. and that's a great, yeah, what a great question. This comes up all the time. What's so interesting too is um, for those of you who work with preschool or kindergartners, what you'll see is that spelling actually comes in to play first, right? So invented spelling start happening, which is very cool. My daughter's in this stage, but word reading, they're, they're more able to do invented spellings than they are able to read or blend words, right? And that's this moment where you see the interaction between in the theory of orthographic mapping, I think in its greatest light. Then what happens is that word reading is just simply easier than spelling. It's easier than spelling because the letters are provided for you. So because the letters are provided for you, you don't, there's not as much cognitive load. You see a B, you're like, oh, okay, and that, that's the B sound. Or you see an A, you know that it's, actually A is a better example. You see an A, you know that it's going to give you the A or the A sign sound later. Later on though, if you're trying to spell and you wanna use the, you hear an A sound in the word and you need to find the A spelling, there's 14 different ways to spell like the long A sound in the English language. That's brutal, I can barely figure it out, right? So, so you have to go into your memory of all of these different spelling patterns and pull mm -hmm. out the right one. So for years, students are, trying out different spelling patterns. And if you know anything about like Gentry's spelling, uh, they go through this transitional stage where they're trying out different patterns that they've learned until they have consolidated spellings or conventional spellings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Number two, for kids who need lots of repetition to orthographically map a word, is there any trick than phoneme graphing mapping again and again? Any other trick, I should say. Yes, yeah, so that would go to, um, I think you can get really creative with graphing phoneme mapping. And I think you all are much better at getting creative than I am. But it's essentially doing any form of letter sound analysis, however you want to do it in the most creative ways possible. So I had mentioned these word ladders. I need to find this other sheet that I had. Um, I had mentioned these word letters. 
uh, we had done things, I've done things with blocks where you actually write letters on blocks and you're having them flip around. I use blocks a lot in reading ready this program I have for sounds, but then you can also use them to do um, anchorings where you're flipping over and you're deciding what letter to use. Mm -hmm. um, anything where you're analyzing what's in the word will do. It doesn't have to be anything outrageous. It's just not doing something along the lines of memorize this word the way it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a question. High frequency, the, the high frequency word game can be used with all words and not just high frequency words, correct? Correct. Okay. All right. Yeah. Here we go. Um, well, here's a great comment. Wow, wow, wow. This has been wonderful. <laughs> really nice. Do you use symbols to code words when you are mapping? For example, a box circle, a box or circle under the anchoring sounds. We, in, in the, when I brought this into Reading Rescue, we started, I think it was just underlining. Oh no, we started circling the violator. I think this is, I just want to pause. This is a great question. You should definitely in your classroom determine your coding scheme, right? So if you're going to circle the violators, the letters that are going rogue, let that be your approach, but stick to it. If you're going to underline your anchors, stick to it. To it. I actually have a grad student that draws an anchor over the anchors. He's a very artsy character. And so, but that's what he, from the beginning of the school year until the end, that's what he does. And he's had a lot of success with this. So whatever your approach, I would say go for it. Okay. Could Dr. Miles please explain to the group the difference between phoneme graphing mapping and orthographic mapping? Teachers often think they are one and the same when orthographic mapping does not occur on paper, it occurs in the brain. Correct. Yes, so graph, great. So orthographic mapping is a theory that has emerged out of the research. So after, I think Ari developed it after 30 years, and now we're into like 40 years of experimental research. That's what the field of reading science is. It's experimental research where you know, researchers like myself and others run experiments where we assign kids to this group versus that group. This group gets this thing, this group gets that thing. And we figure we quantitatively analyze it. Then after all of these years of all of these studies coming together, this theory emerged and was like, look, there's this pattern of how students are learning how to read words. That theory that emerged is a theory of orthographic mapping, which repeatedly in these studies showed that it was when students were trained in letter sound relationships, that glue part, I always go like this, that glue part and ensuring that they have are able to use the word in a meaningful way. That is how these words wind up being stored securely in memory so that when you then present the word, it has been it's able to be read automatically after a certain period of time. So that's the theory of orthographic mapping. Graphing phoneme mapping, and I take this for granted because we throw these terms around so much. Graphemes are letters uh, or letter units that represent a sound and phonemes are your sounds. Whenever you're doing grapheme phoneme mapping, it's just like doing, when I say word analysis, it would be the same thing. You're spending time on a particular word and you're analyzing, discussing what the R in that word says, what the AI in that word says, that's a graphing unit, AI making A, and what the N in that word says. That is graphemes, which are your letters to sounds, or oftentimes you can flip that term too, and you would say phoneme grapheme mapping. Mm -hmm. So the word rain, here it is. Now not, let's not look at the word rain. Let's just count the sounds we hear. I hear R, A, Mm. Oh, three sounds. This is so strange. There's three sounds, but let's look at the word again. But there's four letters. Oh, we've got to do some mapping here. This doesn't, this isn't a computing. And then you map, and it's kind of like mind blowing to the students that you could have three sounds, but four letters. And then you map them together. Okay, wonderful. All right. We are, there was one question someone wanted to know about. Uh, partial alphabetic is that when people are learning their sounds, 
partial alphabetic student who understands some letters and sounds? Yes. Yeah. Partial alph yes, exactly. Partial alphabetic is when pre-alphabetic is when students are not using letter sound knowledge in order to read or spell words. They might be learning letters, but they're not using it yet in any sort of type of spelling or reading way. Partial is when they're actually trying to use some of their letter sound knowledge. So they might spell, this is my favorite stage, they might spell the word spoon with an S and an N. Mm -hmm. And that's brilliant, right? They're using it's an invented spelling. So any anything in that invented spelling, they might be guessing at words, but they're guessing using a S sound at the beginning, or they're guessing a word that has a S and an N sound when they try and read the word. That's your partial alphabetic. Um, and I don't want to forget this, and I just pulled up this sheet I have. So when people are saying, well, what are some other word analysis things? So you've got your high frequency word game. You've got word chains, which I've mentioned. You've got that word mapping with the double decker boxes. You've got word scrambles. That's actually really effective too, where you're scrambling up the letters and the students are remaking the word and you're scrambling again. You can drop in foil letters. Foils are like letters that shouldn't be used. Mm -hmm. So the word scrambles are really helpful. Um, you, we've got word ladders, which I've mentioned, the lookalike reading. That's really, I'm sure you all are using that. Um, you go from the word had to the word head, to the word teal, to the word tell. So you would take phonics patterns that you've taught and you'd put together, put them together in this lookalike word reading, um, word sorts. I bet lots of you are using these. If you have really strong word source, word source where you're focusing on distinguishing bet between some type of phonics concepts or spelling patterns or something like that, you could be using word sorts. And then I mentioned the word mapping. Those are just the, the ones that come to mind off the sheet. Wonderful. Okay, last question, because time is up. Uh, parents live in a flashcard mindset sometimes. What kinds of things could they do at home to support this work? What's your parent? Okay, so my parents should be trained in this. I'm going to go pretty big here. I wrote this free <laughs> caregiver manual. This caregiver manual is like 20 pages and it parallels this reading ready thing that I put together. I really think we should give parents the tools on how to say a word count the number of sounds and map the letters that go to those sounds. I really, and I think I'm positive they can do it. I'm positive they can use um, double decker boxes. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I think that we're not, give, I think we're asking parents to do a lot of things. And again, I've got two young kids, things that cause a lot of consternation at home mm -hmm. and a lot of problems because the kids can't memorize the words and it becomes a battle when actually the parents and the child could be having a lot of fun just analyzing five words that night. And the parents could show how they're analyzing it. Um, things, you know, I, 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 I can, I'll give you guys the caregiver manual too, if you're interested. It maps, it gives the parents a little script on how to do this type of letter sound matching and whatnot. And again, I, you know, I don't, letter sound mapping is not something I invented, right? It's, it comes out of the research there's been a lot of writings about it. I've mentioned some of the researchers on the slides and whatnot. So you'll have the slides. You can look at some of the resources too that are included. Um, so that, that would be wonderful. We, um, our, our whole mission in here is to disseminate information across the world on how to do this. And so if you're willing to give it to us, we're willing to share it. Yeah, there's another really good resource too. I have the I have the stuff that I have on my website that's simple. Um, there's a book by Grace, Phoneme Graphing Mapping, which really goes in depth um, on how to like give even more resources, really train teachers on how to do this. There's another great book that just came out. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the researcher's name, but I also want to give her credit where she's good. She's analyzing even more high frequency words and showing how you would map them into these boxes. Well, Catherine Grace is on our is on our Zoom tonight. Oh, how fun. Where's Catherine? <laughs> I just sent you a note, Katie. I'm halfway through that article to send to you. Oh my gosh. Oh, so Catherine Grace, I Catherine, I hope you saw that I cited you on the slide. Yeah, I did. Thank you. 
Yes, of course. And, and Catherine's in my fine print on the resources slide with Ari and others. And in fact, Catherine's book is right here, this phoning graphing. Yep. Yeah, phonics and science. So th like there are people like Catherine that have put out tremendous work on, on this, like how, how to really go deep. I, you know, I'm a researcher that focuses on the theories and how it applies. Catherine really put together an incredible resource for practitioners that um, I would have on every shelf. Just well, give you a little <laughs> we are going to have Catherine again in the new year sometime, right, Catherine? We just yes. have, we just yes. haven't picked our dates yet. So yes. stay tuned, Hi. everyone. Donna? Yes. Uh, um, there, I will have some news soon. I'm switching publishers. Mm. So that's why I've had to put it off. No worries. Katie was part of helping me choose who. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That's so okay. funny. Yeah. All right. This was wonderful. So um, Dr. Miles, if you'll send us that information, I will share it with everyone and it'll all be good. Very good. That's anything great. you want, like your website, anything, please do send that to us. That's nice. I, I dropped the website in the chat. I dropped, so there's two different, I'll just tell you this last thing. There's a website that I started um, that has a bunch of those infographics on it. So you can go there for those infographics. My grad students get a lot of credit for those. You'll see their names on the bottom. The Reading Ready website is where, that was sponsored by some philanthropies. If you go to the Reading Ready website, you can click on the red button and you can get the caregiver manual that I just mentioned for free. And you can get the whole Reading Ready curriculum that I wrote um, for free. It's like a fever pitch curriculum in the midst of COVID to help kindergartners and first graders just with word reading. So it's like a, it's like a Hegarty meets Catherine Grace meets PAF kind of type of thing. <laughs> no, I'm not seeing that in the chat. If you could pop oh, it sure. again. Oh, wait, here it is. Reading Rescue. Okay. Um, it's on the, so just not, just so you're not confused. It's a, the, uh, Philanthropy that owns Reading Rescue supported the development of Reading Ready, and that's how we can give it for free. I feel very strongly about giving this for free. So if you go to this website, there's all these little training videos that you can watch too. It's super simple though, you guys. You could read this tiny manual. You could read the first seven pages and you could do it tomorrow in your classrooms. It's really simple. You just click on the button for the resources. And then when you go to that, there's a data tracker where you can mark off all your little sessions. And then the whole curriculum is there and the caregiver manual is all there. Wonderful. It's, it's all right. If everyone wants to record the chat or download the chat, don't forget the three buttons on the right and the bottom. Click on that. It says save chat and save it to your own computer. Okay. All right. I think that's a, a wrap from us. I, th thank you again. I, I'm, I just love this information because it's so relevant to what we do every single day. And you yourself know as a practitioner from a classroom how important it is. So thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. I'll drop the other link in right now just so everyone has it. Thanks again, everyone. All right. Nice Thanksgiving. Everyone. Good night, everyone. Yes. Thanks for being here. Bye. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. This was wonderful. Okay. There's that one. This is the site with the infographics. All right. I'm going to keep this on um, until we, yeah, until we're all good here. Okay. I'm going to stop recording.